The course out of the Milky Way was not straight. It zigzagged a little, as much as several light centuries to pass through the densest accessible nebulae and dust banks. Nevertheless, the time aboard was counted in days until she was in the marches of the spiral arm, outward bound into the nearly starless night. Hi guys, it's Quinn here. With AI content on the rise, YouTube is recommending human narrators less and less. If you appreciate my content, consider hitting the like button and subscribing. Thanks so much, guys. The 1960s were a transformative decade for science fiction, marked by a departure from the conventional space operas and hard science fiction tales of earlier years. This era saw the rise of the new wave movement, a literary shift that emphasized stylistic experimentation, psychological depth, and socio-political themes over traditional scientific rigor. Now, we've talked about the new wave of science fiction several times on this channel, and we'll go into even greater detail in my upcoming Mega History of Science Fiction video. During the new wave, writers such as J.G. Ballard, Ursula K. Le Guin, and Frank Herbert, to name a few, pushed the boundaries of the genre, exploring inner space as much as outer space. Science fiction began to intersect more overtly with the countercultural movements of the time. It began to reflect the anxieties about technology, war, and identity that had developed. The genre matured into a platform for challenging existing norms. This is when we really see science fiction start to be used as a vehicle for interrogating real world issues. But not all science fiction produced during the New Wave movement fully shared its philosophy. In fact, most science fiction published during the time would still fit into the traditional definition of sci-fi, which defined the editorial ship of John Campbell in the 1940s and the 1950s. Paul Anderson's Tau Zero, which was written during the late 1960s, is firmly rooted in the Campbellian tradition, emphasizing hard science, rationalism, and a belief in human perseverance through technological mastery. Anderson, like Robert Heinlein and Arthur C. Clarke, continued to write in this mold, even as the broader science fiction field was shifting under the influence of new wave authors who were more interested in literary style, ambiguity, and psychological or sociopolitical concerns rather than scientific extrapolation per se. That is not to say that these authors avoided these themes entirely. In fact, both Heinlein and Clark have works which are considered seminal in the New Wave movement. And while Tau Zero eschews the literary experimentation of the New Wave, it shares the movement's deeper ambition to elevate science fiction beyond mere escapism. What Anderson essentially does with this book is combine hard science fiction with philosophical speculation, and he reaffirms the ability of Campbellian or classic science fiction to also grapple with the same profound questions that science fiction coming out of the new wave could. The 1960s was a decade that was defined by fragmentation and also innovation. And Tau Zero demonstrates that traditional science fiction still had a place among the rest of it. Without a doubt, Tau Zero is one of the most influential works of hard science fiction ever. It was published in 1970 and was based on his earlier short story to outlive eternity. It's a novel that takes real physics, especially relativity, and runs with it to the extreme in a way that's been imitated countless times since. Anderson leans into scientific accuracy, making the book a standout example of how speculative fiction can stay grounded in actual science. It was published in the 1970s, so not all of the science still holds up, believe it or not. Our understanding of the universe has changed a lot in the last 55 years, but that doesn't take away from how ambitious and influential this book still is. The plot of Tau Zero follows the journey of the starship Leonora Christine, a colonization vessel tasked with reaching the nearby star of Beta Virginis. The crew members consisting of 25 men and 25 women are aboard the ship, which is powered by a Bussard ramjet. 
This propulsion system, while revolutionary, cannot facilitate faster than light travel. As a result, the crew's journey is subject to the effects of relativity, especially time dilation. A journey that would take five years for the crew aboard the ship translates to 33 years passing on Earth. Early in their journey, the ship accelerates at a steady rate, eventually reaching a significant fraction of the speed of light. The original mission plan involves decelerating at the same rate during the second half of the journey. However, a disaster strikes when the ship passes through a nebula, damaging the deceleration field generators. They now have no way to slow down, and with no way to slow down unless they randomly encountered resources on their course, they would be forced to continue accelerating towards light speed. Now, the novel's title, which is drawn from the mathematical concept of Tau, is meant to encapsulate the central theme of time dilation and the relative nature of human experience. In the novel, as the ship approaches the speed of light and Tau decreases towards zero, the crew's perception of time becomes increasingly distorted. The growing velocity of the ship results in even more extreme time dilation, causing the crew to experience time at a drastically different rate compared to those left behind on Earth. This novel is actually interspersed with passages where Anderson delves into the intricacies of relativity and time dilation and the ship's mechanical systems. In fact, this is one of the most captivating aspects of Tau Zero because it incorporates all of these scientific explanations into its narrative. This is an approach to science fiction that allows the reader to gain a deeper understanding of the scientific principles that govern the character's fate. Le Chichon does this often in the Three-Body Problem Remembrance of Earth's Past trilogy. Do you know what the year is on Earth? She countered. No. I was the one who got Captain T. Lander to order that particular clock removed. Too morbid an attitude was developing around it. Most of us can make our own estimates anyway. She spoke in a level, indifferent voice. At present, I believe it is about Anno Domini 10,000 at home, give or take several centuries. And yes, I learned in school about the concept of simultaneity, breaking down under relativistic conditions, and I remember that the century mark was expected to be the great psychological hurdle. In spite of that, these mounting dates have meaning. They make us absolute exiles, already, irrevocably. No longer simply our kinfolk must be extinct, our civilization must be. What has happened on Earth, throughout the galaxy? What have men done? What have they become? We will never share in it. We cannot. There's something very existential about what is happening here. As the crew hurtles through the dark, lonely universe, they become increasingly aware that they are very likely the last remnants of humanity. They are stranded in the distant future with no prospect of ever returning to Earth. They are quite literally moving further and further away from their home planet and closer to the literal end of the universe. As the novel goes on, the concept of Tau, or proper time, becomes more central to the narrative. The closer the ship gets to the speed of light, the closer Tau comes to zero. And this results in billions of years passing in what feels like moments for the crew. Ultimately, the universe itself appears to be on the verge of collapse and the crew witnesses the approaching big crunch. As I mentioned earlier, Tau Zero was written in 1970, a time when the big crunch theory was widely accepted among cosmologists as the likely fate of the universe. Now, according to this theory, the universe would eventually stop expanding and begin to contract under its own gravity, ultimately collapsing into a singularity. This idea was a prevailing thought in the scientific community at that time, and that obviously influenced Anderson's depiction of the universe's eventual collapse. Of course, since the book's publication, our understanding of cosmology has evolved dramatically. Today, the Big Crunch theory has largely been replaced by the theory of an accelerating universe driven by dark energy, which makes up approximately 70% of the universe, which would suggest that the universe will continue to expand indefinitely. Ultimately, in the book, Leonardo Christine ultimately survives the Big Crunch. As the ship continues to accelerate, it approaches ever closer to the speed of light, and as this happens, the ship becomes effectively frozen in its own proper time. Tau approaches zero. 
even as the universe around them ages rapidly. Eventually, they reach the final stages of cosmic evolution, the Big Crunch. As I said, in relativity, Tau represents proper time experienced by an object traveling through space-time. For the crew aboard Leonardo Christine, Tau is at zero. The universe ages infinitely while they experience virtually no passage of time. In other words, the ship's velocity relative to the collapsing universe makes it effectively skip over the singularity. Anderson postulates that the Big Crunch leads to a new Big Bang, a cosmological bounce. This idea, while speculative, is not completely outside the realm of modern theoretical physics. Some theories in quantum gravity, like certain interpretations of loop quantum cosmology, allow for a cyclical universe, where one universe ends in a collapse and is immediately followed by the birth of a new one. Now, of course, Quinn's Ideas is not a physics channel, so if you want more on that, probably watch an actual scientist talk about this. Now, the ship is still unable to decelerate as it passes through the singularity, through the death of one universe and the birth of a new one. In this new universe, however, due to the abundance of resources, they are finally able to decelerate and begin the search for a new habitable planet. I'd like us to have our pick of worlds when our descendants get around to interstellar colonization, he said. And I'd like us to become, oh, the elders. Not imperialist, that's ridiculous, but the people who were there from the beginning and know their way around, and who are worth learning from. Never mind what physical shape the younger races have, who cares? But let's make this, as nearly as possible, a human galaxy, in the widest sense of the word, human. Maybe even a human universe. I think we've earned that right. In addition to its scientific and existential themes, Tau Zero also touches on the in-universe political and cultural subtext that influenced the worldview of its characters. Interestingly enough, the Earth from which the crew departs is one where the nations of the world have entrusted Sweden with overseeing global disarmament, and the Swedish Empire has emerged as a dominant power. I think this is meant to be Anderson's subtle commentary on the role of nationalism and power dynamics in shaping human behavior. You see this in the rivalry between American and Swedish astronauts on board the ship. Tau Zero is also a book about the human spirit, and most good science fiction is. In this book, as the crew faces the challenges of surviving, in a continuously accelerating starship, they have to grapple with the implications of their journey through time and the fact that everything they once knew is forever lost to them. This book is obviously still to this day a seminal work in the realm of hard science fiction, obviously highly influential. The Zeely sequence by Stephen Baxter comes to mind immediately. Of course, Lucian's Remembrance of Earth's Past trilogy, Greg Egan's work comes to mind, and countless others. I totally understand why this book has stood the test of time, and I enjoyed the way it blends scientific rigor with emotional depth and philosophical explorations. Thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you like and subscribe for more Quinn's ideas. And now it's time for Patreon questions. So I asked over on Patreon what were some of you guys' favorite stories, movies, books, whatever, that deal with time dilation or relativity in some way. And I got a lot of answers. Toomey says, I'd have to say Hyperion. Now Hyperion is of course one of my favorite science fiction series. The first two, Hyperion and Fall of Hyperion, are particularly good. And yes, these books do deal with time dilation and relativity. You have a network of planets that are connected through Farcaster and Fatline technology that allows instant transportation and communication between distant worlds, but some worlds aren't connected. And in the series initially, Hyperion is one of these unconnected worlds. So travel to these worlds um, is, of course, subject to relativity. Donovan Carr also mentions Hyperion, but also suggests Stephen Baxter's Manifold Time, which I have not read yet. My brain is still processing Stephen Baxter's Zeely sequence. Donovan is recommending going into this blind, and I believe him because Donovan has given great recommendations in the past. Joseph Nizalik suggests Project Hail Mary. Now this book is by Andy Weir, and I actually have this one on my shelf, but have not read it yet. 
and I do like the work of Andy Weir. I mean, the only other book that I've read by him is The Martian, and I really enjoyed how technical it was and how detailed he got into what it would take to survive alone on Mars, and would it be something that's even plausible? It was a neat book about science. So I imagine that Project Hail Mary will be more of the same, so when I get to that one, I'll let you know what I think of it. Charles Lee Thorpe throws out the forever war. Time dilation is central to the story, he says. And yes, time dilation is central to that story. I've already done about a 45 minute video on the forever war, so you should definitely check that out, everyone listening, if you have not watched it, because it is definitely an influential book. Uh, it's a foundational book, not without flaws, but I think it's really interesting um, when you learn about the time that surrounds this book coming out and where the author was coming from with some of the ideas that he presents in the book. And I definitely get into that in the video. So definitely The Forever War is on this list for best stories involving time dilation or relativity. Benjamin Herson says, they can't remember anything that fits this category within the last few years. Just a lot of books playing with the sleep cycle, waking up, going back to sleep, and time passing scenario. Um, and they mentioned Children of Time as one of the examples, Deepness in the Sky as one of the examples. And uh, while this is definitely different from time dilation or relativity, I also enjoy this concept in science fiction as well. It's one of my favorite tropes when it's done well. And Children of Time is definitely one of the best examples of this uh, with the events on the vessel known as the Gilgamesh. So while not exactly time dilation, definitely a cool concept. Shane Emmons mentioned Speaker for the Dead, classic book, sequel to Ender's Game. And yes, time dilation plays a significant role in that book as well. Orson Scott Card is also one of those authors in science fiction that has been extremely influential and whose work has definitely stood the test of time. As far as it still being readily consumed today and as far as that influence permeating uh, the modern zeitgeist. And finally, James Donahoe mentions a Superman issue where Superman is able to witness the explosion of his home planet. Now, to my knowledge, this isn't exactly time dilation or relativity. This would have more to do with the distance that it takes the light from Krypton to travel to Earth. Krypton is technically already destroyed. It's the light of Krypton being destroyed that Superman would have seen. But, interesting example, nonetheless. And thanks everyone on Patreon for the constant support. And thanks for listening to this video. Peace out, guys.